for the time. Tea time. Yeah, this is tea time. Yeah, make a difference. One cup at a time. Tea time. So be sure to grab your tea, grab a seat, and tune in to Miss Liz. Tea time. Making a difference. One cup at a time. Well, welcome to tea time. You know what time that means. It means storytelling time and words because that's the type of tea that we serve in this house on Miss Liz's platform. So today I have Joel McKay here. He is rescheduled as you guys seen he was supposed to be, but you know, life happens. We get, we get under the weather sometimes, but Joel has come back and we are going to share an incredible tea today. We're going to teach you a tea of tough, emotional, and adventure. And we're going to talk about his book, It Came From the Trees. That's why we're going to do a little bit of horror, guys. Uh, that's what we're doing today. But before we get started, we're going to get you over to Miss Liz's YouTube channel. Subscribe, ring that little doorbell, and you can watch these tea times at any time. You can watch them morning, afternoon, evening, watch a replay, share them with your family, your friends, co-workers, all of that good stuff, because we have tea time of many different flavors and topics on the platform. So let's get started with the disclaimer and then a little bit on Joel. And then we're going to get Joel in here and we're going to spill some tea with you guys. So if you'd like to leave any comments or questions or anything like that, you can leave them in the comment section or di directly send me a message through my Facebook page and I'll get those questions out to Joel during our conversation. And again, thank you for all tuning in today. Disclaimer for Miss Liz's Tea Time Live Show. Miss Liz, myself, is going live using StreamYard. Before leaving a comment, please grant StreamYard permission to see your name at StreamYard.com. Please be advised that the content brought forward for any Tea Time show hosted by myself, Miss Liz, is always brought forward in good faith. However, may bring forth dialogues and opinions that are not representative of my platform. The facts and information are perceived to be accurate at the giving time of airing. All Tea Time guests and audience participants are responsible for using their good judgment and taking any action that may relate to the discussion. The content brought forward may include discussions for some where they may be emotionally at risk. It is significant to know that the show is engaging in discussion forums only to offer and inspire awareness and connection and is not providing therapeutical advice. If you have any questions about the disclaimer or the panelist discussion, you may freely contact me, Ms. Liz, through my email at bookingmissliz at gmail.com. Moving forward, should you choose to voluntarily participate in today's show in any aspect, I myself, Miss Liz, welcomes you. And should you decide that the show is not made for you at this time, I respect those wishes and we'll see you at a later show at a later date and time. And again, all Tea Time shows, original dates are Thursdays, 3 p.m. and 7 p.m. If you see Tea Time on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, it's a rescheduled special or surprise Tea Time that I'm bringing to the table. So now a little bit about my guests. Well, Joe McKay is based in Northern British Columbia and has crafted compelling work, including the werewolf no novellas, Wolf at the Door, and various short fiction pieces published by renowned presses. With a rich background in sales, journalism, and public relations, Joel brings a unique perspective to storytelling. Outside of writing, he enjoys fishing, hiking, biking, and exploring the stunning landscapes of British Columbia with his family. Let me get Joel in here and let's have some tea together. Welcome, Joel. Good afternoon. Nice to see you, Liz. It is a pleasure. We were having a good conversation before we went live, and mm -hmm. uh, we'll, we'll get into a little bit more of that during tonight, this, this afternoon's open discussion. But Joel, let's get started with who was Joel as a little guy and who is Joel now as a grown man? Oh, you're just diving right in, eh? Um, I right in. That's the way I go. <laughs> yeah. So Joel as a little guy was, so I grew up in um, a, a town called Burnaby, uh, just outside of Vancouver, British Columbia. Um, and I was a mischief maker and, an, and a walking imagination. And uh, at that point in time, I had uh, sandy blonde hair and blue eyes. And uh, I was often in a ninja outfit running around uh, the neighborhood in the summer, climbing trees and, you know, uh, having, having fun. Um, I was always, as I say, a, a walking imagination. I, I grew up at a time in the 80s and 90s when you could still go out the door as a kid. Uh, and then come back, you know, go out the door in the morning and then come back at, at dinner time when you heard your parents holler for you. Uh, so I did have the, the benefit of, of that kind of an old school uh, experience growing up, uh, classic suburbia, but kind of in an urban center. Um, and I was somebody who I think always wanted to see how far I could go in life. 
for no other reason than um, it's a good story. Um, and I've always had this underwriting sort of belief of um, make your life an adventure, have fun with it, wherever that takes you and define what you think success looks like in life. So um, for me, you know, chasing money was, was never being a rich guy was never really what I was after. I wasn't trying to get in any certain place. I was just trying to make decisions along the way that made my life interesting. And who am I today? Um, well, I think I'm, you know, despite my many flaws of which I, I have a lot, um, I am that person I think my eight and 10 year old self wanted to be. Um, I've, I've had a, a quite a life and impacted and only into, you know, almost 40 years. It'll be 40 years this December. Um, I live in a place that is nothing but adventure. Um, I've had really interesting careers along the way. Um, got really close friends. I've got kids um, and have been able to, in the last number of years, pursue the thing that I always wanted to be when I grew up, which is a fiction writer, a novelist. Um, and it doesn't pay the bills yet, um, but um, it is certainly as it often doesn't in Canada. Um, but it's amazing to see my work uh, get out there and still hold down a, you know, a full-time job that is interesting to me and compelling and um, live in a place that uh, I never thought I would live in when I was a kid, uh, which is in the northern part of our province, um, but is a place that I can't imagine ever leaving now. Um, that is sort of, for me, is, is just heart and soul of, of who I am and where I want to be. So it's a really long-winded answer uh, to say that um, by and large, I think my eight-year-old self would be proud of my 39-year-old self. Um, and I'm proud of my eight-year-old self too, uh, because that imagination, um, that child uh, is still there. He's alive and he's alive and well. Um, and that's pretty cool. I like that you said that because, you, you know, being a child and being an adult, we, we bring that little child with us as we become adults, right? And we want to make that little child proud. And and you've said that, Joe, like, you know, I'm, my eight and 10 year old would be proud of me. What got you into the fiction writing? Um, well, it's kind of a funny story. So at that imagination, I played a lot with action figures when I was growing up. So um, for me, it was like G.I. Joe, Ghostbusters, um, Star Wars, that kind of thing. Um, and I played with action figures in a way that I later found out was different than a lot of kids. Um, I made up my own stories. I made my own characters. And every day when I, I would set up like these grand, grand stories and, and stuff and each day, whatever was going on with those action figures in my house um, was like the next chapter of a long story. And so I was crafting story before I knew what crafting story was and um, sort of playing it out. And I was, we grew up with a lot of movies too. So I'm watching movies, watching TV you know, starting to, you know, inadvertently absorb story structure and like epic battles and all that kind of stuff, and then going and creating my own. And I got to, I was sort of 12 years old and we had moved from Burnaby to a town about 30 minutes away called Port Moody. And, um, you know, you're getting into that preteen phase. And I, I'm sad to say I got into the too, school, too cool for school phase as a teenager, as so many of us do. Um, and a friend came over one day and I was still playing with my action figures. He's like, you're too old for that. And I was embarrassed by it. Um, and so I kind of stopped playing with toys, but I had those, those stories still in my head and I needed an outlet for it. So I, we didn't have a lot of money and I'm, I'm not an illustrator or a drawer by any sense or, or a computer programmer, or I didn't have access to a camera. Um, but what you can do with literally a, you know, a, a notepad and a pen or a pencil is write stories. So, and I love to read. So I started writing down the stories that I was playing out with my action figures. I started my first novel when I was 12 and I finished it when I was 14. Um, and it was terrible, um, but I did finish it um, and I never stopped. And, you know, there's a lot of other things I've wanted to do in my life and a lot of other things I've done in my life um, professionally to pay the bills and, and, and sort of chart my own course for myself. But one thing that's always been consistent is being a writer, always wanting to be a writer and a novelist and, and you know, spend my days in my head and, and letting those stories out. Like so many people... Um, I lost a lot of that when I was a teenager because I was distracted by, you know, social activities and, and trying to play into that at the time. But by the time I hit my 20s, 
I, I got back into it. And then I got really serious um, in sort of my early to mid thirties where I said, okay, like I've, you know, it's time to actually really learn how to do this and see how, where I can take it and haven't stopped uh, ever since. So it's now been, I would say, yeah, over 25 years that I've been writing stories. Um, and what's not changed is my imagination. That's been consistent since I was a kid, which is kind of kind of cool. Um, so yeah, that's how I got into it. So Joel, are you still playing with toys? No, <laughs> video <laughs> games, video games for sure. Um, I, so I, I'm still a gamer and I collect retro systems and new systems and play video games. I don't have a lot of time for it these days because I've got young kids and a busy career and I write and stuff like that. But video games are very much a, a still a thing for me and, a, and an amazing escape. But I do have like action figures still. Like I've got like a, like a Shakespeare action figure and a John A. McDonald action figure and then like a William Riker action figure. So I still have them in my office kind of kicking around, but no, I don't, I don't play with them. Every once in a while I get an idea, like I'm going to go buy a bunch of GI Joes and just start playing again. And then I realize if anybody saw me doing that at this age, it's not socially acceptable. There would be serious questions. So I kind of, I still hold back from my authentic self in some regards. Well, Joel, you have kids, so you can use the kids and say, you know what, I'm playing with the children. I do. I do. Yeah, yeah. My, they're both girls, and they play with Barbies at this point in time and other things. So sometimes I hang out with them and, and sort well, of- Well, Joe meets Barbie, right? <laughs> yeah, Joe meets Barbie. What's funny is they're so much like me, because when I was a kid, I didn't actually want to play action figures with other people because I had my own stories, and I knew where the story was going to go. So I played by myself. And my kids are like that too. Like if dad sits down with them to have a, you know, try and play with them, they're like, what are you doing here? Like, leave me alone. <laughs> right. This is my story, dad. I'm, I'm doing my own thing. And I, and I, they got their own get, structure going on. You're, yeah. You're, yeah. You're, I get you're it. I'm like, using oh, a plot okay. line here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm like, okay. I'm not going to interfere. You do you. Yeah. So what got you into horror? Um, I always like scary stories. Um, I, I, so when I first became a reader, it was fantasy. Um, and so I'm a big, big fan of fantasy. Um, that, that I would say is, is home for me um, in so many ways. But um, one thing that's true is that back in when I was growing up, like you used to watch horror movies when you were a lot younger. I'm not sure it's quite the same anymore. I remember going to video stores and always loving going down the horror aisle just to look at the box art on the, on the beta yeah. cassettes or, and then eventually the, the VHS uh, cassettes. And I had an older brother and my older brother loved to watch it too. And um, so I got exposed to stuff at a, an age I never should have. And it scared the lights out of me. Um, but I loved it. And I think there's a part of me with horror where it's a fear that is fictional and by embracing it, you can almost face your own fears, right? You, you, you There's something psychological there where you're able to, with horror, sort of grapple with your own fears, um, face yourself a little bit, have fun with it. You realize that it is fictional. Um, versus the the very challenging and horrific things that we we find in our life that cause trauma, um, those are very different. So, like for example, like I love horror and I can go anywhere with it, but don't get me to watch um, like true crime. Like I can't, I I'm not interested because it's oh. um, it's too harsh um, for me because it's based in reality. <laughs> or you know, I've got friends who like to you know occasionally on TV used to be able to watch surgeries. Like I can't like I can't watch an actual surgery like that. It just, it makes me vibrate uncomfortably, but give me like a, a really gory saw movie. I'm, I'm good to go. So it, it, so horror for me lives fully in, in a fictional universe in my head. It's a place where I can, I can face fears and explore fear and do it in a, in a safe environment. Um, but you know, it is uh, something that, I don't think I chose consciously, it chose me. Like if you wanted to be a successful um, author or writer, horror is probably the last genre you would pick because it's like one or two steps removed, the public sees it as from like erotica, right? Like it's not quite, 
you know, socially acceptable and people always kind of give a, me a lifted eyebrow when I say, oh yeah, and I write horror and in, in, in my, they're like, what's wrong with you, right? Like, what's that? What's that I always want to like pick your brains. Like, why? What, what movie did you see that was like, I got to write this? Like, Well, I can answer some of that. Um, for me, um, I would say things that really opened up horror for me like i saw child's play and alien and aliens as a as a young kid um i saw uh what else uh the thing escape from new york um fire from the sky when i was getting i was born in 84 so in 93 when the x-files premiered which was filmed in in my hometown um i watched the pilot and was hooked and have been a fan ever since and it scared the lights out of me as a eight nine year old and so i was always kind of hooked on it but i would think the thing that you know really welcomed me into horror is what a lot of people call co cozy horror these days so things like the monster squad which is like horror but it's but it's like a kid's movie it's you can watch it as a kid the halloween tree which is based on a ray bradbury uh story which is cozy cartoon welcoming horror the goosebumps books the spooksville books were things that i just devoured as a kid you could get into that supernatural scary space without you know having to sleep with the lights on if you like if you watch child's play or hellraiser when you're you know seven or eight years old and then in 1999 um there was a movie that came out that remains my favorite tim burton movie called sleepy hollow and Sleepy Hollow, of course, is based on the Headless Horseman tale from upper upstate New York. And what Tim Burton did there in terms of set design, story, coloring, um, was to me just gorgeous. And he was able to tell a gothic story and a bit of a gothic romance with some adventure. But in a place that it's not, it, it's a horror movie, but it's not scary, it's fun. And, you know, exposure to those things really broadened out that, you know, horror isn't all the exorcist um horror can be whatever you want it to be and i loved playing in that supernatural space um and adventure space and humor um I'm, yeah. i you probably gather i'm somebody who likes to you know not take life too seriously um and i think you see that reflected in in my own fiction you know, where i'm often playing with you know humor right beside something that's spooky or scary or or thrilling um because i think those two kind of you know, they're two flavors that go well together. So do you have a dark sense of humor? Oh yeah. <laughs> I was, uh, my, my dad, my dad was a police officer. Well, I grew up in a bit of a rough neighborhood. Um, and so you, you were exposed to a lot. My dad was a police officer and oftentimes growing up, you'd be in the cruiser with him and you got exposed to that jaded police sort of view of the world, which, you know, it almost makes you cynical at a young age. Um, and I was a journalist for, uh, that was one of my first careers and, you know, being working in a newsroom in a major city, you kind of get a bit cynical and jaded too. And so, yes, I, I have a bit of a dark sense of humor. Uh, I also have a solid dad sense of humor now that I've been a father for 10 years. So I'm kind of all over the map, but I will be, and most people will tell you, um, I'm one of those people that if I'm teasing you, if I'm dropping F-bombs and, and other four letter words around you, that's a sign of affection for me. It's not It's not a criticism, it's I'm comfortable with you. And I, I like to live in that space where we can be authentic and just throw down. And I think that's why I live where I live, right? Like I, I don't think I fit in in like a downtown Toronto, downtown New York or downtown Vancouver where it's kind of buttoned up and there's, you know, a certain etiquette that is expected. I can do that and turn it on if I want, but my comfortable space is being in uh, like a mill town. Um, yeah, with like laid back, with, right? Laid back with regular people who just tell it how it is, um, who yeah. work hard um, and like to be outdoors. Those are my people. That's my 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 spirit and my comfortable place, and I found that here in Northern BC. And so, yeah, it, my sense of humor seems to match up well with the rural small town, which is not what I grew up in, but was able to eventually find. Well, I think I think uh, we talked about that before we went live. Right, is the the corporate world right where it's cold? It's it's so like I feel that it's yeah. really un unauthentic. You know, because you're yeah. going in, you're buttoning your up, you're putting your suit on. But then when you get home, you're like, oh, my God, I had the worst day ever. I didn't have anybody to talk to. Da, 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 da. You know, it comes with a really cold feel, right? Um, yeah, it does. And I don't think it's human. 
you know, and, and to some extent, right? Like, I mean, we all at times have to button up and, and present ourselves in a certain way out of out of respect for for other people and to get work done. There's no question about that. But I think when you are constantly finding yourself in an environment where you're forcing yourself to be something that you're not, I think it manifests as stress and anxiety internally over time and leads to depression. And so this is just my experience. I'm not, I'm not a medical doctor or in, in any way. So, you know, I feel people, the same way because you know, when I'm not myself, people can tell because yeah. my energy is completely yeah. different. I cannot yeah. fake it. My face will give it away that I'm not Me enjoying too. myself. Right. I'm just like, guys, I don't even have to say it. Just look at my face. I'm not enjoying yeah. myself. Like, yeah, yeah, totally. Right. And so like, I do think there's, I think we all need to strike a balance between being respectful and observing etiquette and understanding different social contexts and situations that we're, we're in and, and professionalism, but not to the extent where you are in it, you know, outside of the home, somebody completely different than you are inside of the home. I think that's going to lead to, you know, some real mental health challenges, um, some unhappiness. It's going to affect your, your, your own version of yourself, how you interpret yourself, and then ultimately your relationships, right? And so yeah. part of my journey has been, you know, realizing that because I've I've existed in so many different professional environments in the private and public sector and, and often at very senior levels. And um, I can turn that on, but I don't want to be that all the time. And I find, you know, as I get older, I'm, I'm better able to channel Joel who is truly Joel uh, without offending people at the same time and not carry that weight and anxiety around with me. It's a journey. I haven't figured it out yet, but I'm aware of it. Um, and I think it's important to, to be yourself because how else, like, what are we all here for? Like, we're like, honestly, the only thing in life that really matters is your relationship with other people. Um, right. all, all your titles, all your possessions, all your, your finances, all those things, they all sound nice, but really what it all comes down to at the end of the day is, um, who's in your life that you love? Who loves you? How are you um, engaging with them uh, for as long as you can? Because uh, life's short. Um, and if you're not being yourself, um, you're wasting a lot of time. You're not going to get back. Right? Because once you're gone, you're gone. <laughs> you're gone. Yeah, you're gone. It doesn't matter what you believe, right? Like, yeah. like and, and I think that there's a, a universal truth to this. Whether you believe in an afterlife or, or not is beside the point. All that we do know is that this is this is life and when you die you don't come back there's no evidence that you do and so if you just look at it from a, a practical perspective it's like that doesn't that mean you should kind of make the most of this while you're here and if everybody else is on the same journey that you are this is all one life and why are you wasting time you know carrying around anger and and you know not treating people well because they're all on the same journey too right so why would you want to walk around with that that stress and that unhappiness over time and we all have to live our own lives and decide what's right for us but i i think it makes a lot of sense to look after people while you're here too like i turned 40 in december um and you know I, it occurs to me that no no man in my family that i'm aware of has made it past 75 so wow. i'm hoping to make it past 75 um but if that's the case i'm already more than halfway through here um and time i, I learned when i had kids time speeds up so you know i i do need to you know make the most of of the time that i have and i would prefer to do that with the people i love rather than chasing uh titles and and you know things that i can't take with me wherever i go when this life is done yeah so Joel, I, I want to get into the horror fiction because life is yep. horror, right? Yeah. <laughs> it can be really scary sometimes because you know we make it really so if you could be a vampire werewolf or uh what's the other one that we have going out there in stories? Zombie, mummy. A zombie, yeah. What would you be? Oh, vampire for sure, because you get to be uh, handsome and charming and live a lot longer than everybody else. And vampires always seem to, you know, have really interesting backstories. You know, the werewolf, the problem with the werewolf is that, the, you know, you that's cool, but you don't really control the animal, right? So oh. there's a, a consequence there of that transformation on a, on a monthly basis that's a problem. The zombie is mindless, and uh, that doesn't sound like much fun to me most days. Um, and the mummy is wrapped in bandages and is just staggering around. So I think the vampire is the clear winner. 
Um, the sad part and the tragic part about the, the vampire story, depending on how you do it, is that you're going to outlast everybody else. Um, and unless you choose to, to bring people along with you, um, then you're going to watch all your loved ones disappear over time while you're in sort of eternity of this, this curse. And if you do bring somebody with you, well, you've cursed them too. So there's a big moral question there that's always fascinated me with that. How about you? I, I you know, because of that answer that you gave me, I would I would pick the vampire too. I was the werewolf for the longest time. I don't know because I just like the, the nighttime, right? I just feel yeah strong at nighttime. So I'm really connected to the werewolf. But the way that you've explained that, Joel, the vampire, yeah, he you know lives on forever, but it's a curse, right? It's a curse. curse of yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and and to some extent, I think that's kind of the underlying story in there, which is hey, there's a yin and yang here, which is you could live longer, you could beat your your mortality, um, but you can't beat everybody else's mortality. So, you know, what are you accepting? You see that too in fiction with um, elves, right? Because elves are often, you know, the long lived race. And you see that in their relationship with, you know, humans or dwarves or other races where um, one of the underlying sort of thematic currents there is similar to a vampire where the, the elves are almost... Um, they're blessed, but they're also cursed um, by this long life and what that means uh, for them and how they interact with others, their their own relationships with their loved ones and kids and stuff. It's a it's a fascinating way to unpack this question that we all struggle with every day, which is our own mortality and and you know how we deal with the passage of time. Well, and it's different species, right? Like yeah. zombies, werewolves, vampires, and it's another form yeah. of species. It is. But it's all yeah. cursed, right? And life is cursed. Like, even as human beings, we're cursed. You know, we have yeah. some genetic things that are passed down, you know, like mental health, addiction, stuff like that. We're cursed, right? Yeah. Uh, it's through yeah. the genetics. Uh, we have no control over it sometimes. We're just like, well, why am I doing this? Like, you know? Yeah. Yeah, no, it's true. There's, and, and I mean, you see that reflected in theology too. Like, in, in, um, I mean, depending on how you interpret it, literally or otherwise, but if you look at the Garden of Eden story between Adam and Eve, at the very least, it, it does talk about, you know, um, basic flaws in human beings. I, I, Cain and Abel would be another story that's that's like that, right? Where you you have a human, they have on one side wondrous opportunity and the other side inborn flaws that ultimately cost them something, right? And I think, you know, aside from sort of, uh, you know, the religious sort of components of it, if you just look at it from a narrative story to guide you through life, there's value in recognizing that because, yeah, we're all kind of flawed. Um, we're all just trying to get through and there's things that happen you have no control over in, in your life that are both good and bad. And the only thing you have control over is, you know, how you react to it, whether or not you keep going. Um, that is a universality, right? That we all have to struggle with all the time. And so to your, to borrow your words, it's, we are cursed, but we are also blessed in, in yeah. some ways. And, and that's what makes every moment, at least from my perspective, incredibly meaningful right is is being aware of that um self-aware individually as as a species that um yeah you got to be really careful with um how you guide your life and the decisions you make because they they have it has implications over time but you also can't be paralyzed by it you have to live um because it doesn't doesn't matter what you do um the the clock's ticking right well it goes right back to the roots right and your book is called it came from the tree so the roots the branches how it came all together so let's talk about that book because i yeah. was really intrigued with this book and I, the title of it really got my attention because i'm a tree hugger so i love trees <laughs> oh okay <laughs> so let's talk about this book how did you get the title how, how did the storyline come about um, yeah so the book yeah so the book was um it's a collection of five stories one of them is a novelette and that's the title of the story it came from the tree um, and it's not all horror. There is some horror stories in there. The title story is, and I'll talk about that in a second, but there's also dark fantasy in there. There's an adventure. There's a sci-fi story. Um, there's a weird Western story. Um, and um, it's so it's a potpourri. And I did that on purpose. I was thinking very much about 
you know, I've, there's a lot of nostalgia from the time that I grew up in. I was thinking about, you know, when you used to go into the spin rack at your local corner store and, you know, you would pick up a comic or you would pick up a, you know, a paperback that was like just a collection of pulp fiction. And, and so I was trying to recreate that feeling of sort of random stories that are thrown together. It's also purposefully short. Um, the, the whole book is only about 140, 150 pages. It's an afternoon read of, of five stories. And I did that on purpose because I wanted it to be accessible. Um, I'm always thinking about how how do I get the reader from the first page to the last page in, in the most efficient but enjoyable, fun way. And I worked with uh, Keelan Patrick Burke, who's a horror author and illustrator. And, and we did, or he did the cover design, but he also did an illustration for each story, um, which is something I love. You don't see a lot of anymore. So each story has its own main illustration with it. And then I added author notes um, at the end of every story to just sort of talk a bit about what I was thinking. Um, what were the subjects that I was tackling in each story that I that I wrote? So it came from the trees and other violent aberrations is a, is a throwback to an old style of pulp fiction anthology. It very accessible, short, um, but the entire design of the book is is really done to harness that nostalgia but also give the reader more of an adventure than just a table of contents and five or ten stories and text right like i it, it's something that the book itself is an experience um and is it is meant to be the title story uh, you say a tree hugger is about a group of tree planters who are um, it just north of Prince George in the interior of British Columbia, and they go a little too far into a cut block and they awaken something, um, which is this beetle um, that kind of infests their body and then takes over their body and transforms them into beetles, killing them in the process. Um, and this story is, is basically told in one night of how rapid that change uh happens for them so it's a horrific story um it is creature horror it is set in the outback of british columbia it does pull on themes um and experiences i've had being out in, in the outback certainly never being transformed into a beetle or anything like that but knowing what it's like to be way out in the wilderness with no cell service and um hours away from a paved road um, and forestry is a big part of our world um, up here, and so it, it does definitely draw on on some themes out of out of forestry. In this case, not logging, but rather actually the tree planting aspect, and and that you know what can happen when when man goes a little too far in, into nature, right, and, and discovers yeah. the unknown, and nature wins ultimately, right. So that's the the titular story there, and it is totally designed. Uh, to uh, be a story that uh, is gripping and scary and grosses you out at, at, at a couple of moments and then ends with a classic sort of short story ending, which I will give away. Um, but yeah, that's it came from the trees. And that also explains uh, the title, uh, which is, I don't really know what this thing is. It's an it. Um, and But it did come from, from the trees, which speaks so much to um, the nature of Northern BC. Well, and there's a lot of different species that live in trees that we don't see. Yeah, there are. That we, yeah. we find. And we're like, what is that weird bug? Like, what, what is this? Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So and, and species out there. Yeah. And, you know, like the, the genesis of the story really came from the mountain pine beetle epidemic um, that decimated 80% of the pine trees in northern British Columbia between the late 90s and, and you know, just a few years ago when the, the epidemic came and it was a beetle. Um, it was a beetle we couldn't stop in this province and is, is wreaking havoc in Alberta right now, too. And and is uh, a result of, you know, I think um, poor public policy, but also climate change uh, to really boil it down. And this and what we experienced um, in B.C. completely transformed our landscape, uh, transformed habitats, transformed our economy um, and, it, and ha will have impacts for it has had impacts, will have impacts for decades to come. It's just a tiny little beetle. It infested all of these pine trees and it's completely natural it's just it got out of hand by a, a number of circumstances that all came together over or over a period of time and so that gave me this thought like you know we often worry about the big things but actually something small like a bug and given the right conditions can completely transform the lives for everybody and so the working title originally was beetle kill 
um, and which is what we call pine beetle killed trees in northern BC. Um, but my editor gave me, he's like, nah, he's like, that's not that good. How about, you know, I came from the tree. So that was actually his idea to change the title. And I think well, I like the title because the title is like something came from the trees. Like what, what came from it? Right. So it gets yeah. you engaged to read the story because you want to know what came from it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's funny too, because forestry continues to sort of play a, a, a big theme in my fiction. So I just finished drafting a novel. Um, called The Forest Bleeds Black. So that is its working title. And it's about um, the resurrection of the coastal pulp industry in, in Northern BC. And it's a cosmic horror. Um, and uh, suffice to say, people from outside of a little ghost town come back, buy a pulp mill and a sawmill and get it running and start cutting down big ancient trees and wake up something that they don't understand um, and is way, way worse uh, than anybody could imagine. And so that forestry theme is is kicking in there as well. Wow. It reminds me of the kids' cartoon Fern Gully that my kids used to watch. Yeah. Like, yeah. Cutting the trees and it took the it yep. opened that that spirit or something, right? That Katie right. and Batty was in it. I, one of my favorite shows watching with the kids when they were younger. Yep. Uh, yep. You know, but it gives you a good storyline of how to take care of nature as well and to respect it. it. It does. And, you know, I, I will say, like, I'm not anti-industry. I run an economic development organization in northern BC, right? Like, I'm actually pro-industry. Um, but, it, you know, I, I am one of those people that thinks, look, you come from rural areas, especially rural and northern Canada, like, we are going to make our living off of things that we pull out of the ground and then turn into products. That's going to continue to be the case. There's nothing wrong with that. We need to keep doing that. But the way in which we do that needs to be balanced with how we look after the landscape right? Especially with, with the climate changing, regardless of what's causing that change, you, you, we do, we do need to be stewards of our, of our natural ecosystem, right? And so striking that balance is, is I think incredibly important. And I think that's what I'm ultimately getting back, getting to in my stories when I, I set fiction in Northern BC. I'm not saying um, we shouldn't have logging and logging is bad and forestry is bad. I love the forestry industry. I think it's, it's fascinating and cool and it's an adventure in and of itself. But what I am saying is that how we've gone about doing this in so many com communities has asked, actually left a lot of communities worse off. And it's just simply because <clears throat> we've extracted the value um, from these places. We've sent it off to major urban centers that profit and benefit off of small communities. And um, we haven't reinvested in, in our own diversification initiatives. So it's I'm trying to get at through a crazy horror story or science fiction story whatever wake up people <laughs> yeah like wake up and do this with balance and yeah. look multiple generations into the future how are we leaving these communities better off if we are going to extract that kind of value out of out of our people and our land absolutely my dad worked in the sawmill for 32 years he was a, a, a sawdust uh, but he did the plywood where yep. they glued all the plywood together, the sawdust yep. and all that. And just the smell of it reminds me of my father. Um, but I find in today's society, it's all or nothing, right? We just take it all or we don't get nothing. That's how yep. it is, right? So if you yeah, take it we, all at once and we don't have anything left. Yeah, yeah. It's um, And again, I guess I come back, I come at this from a, a storyteller's perspective and somebody who's, you know, I come out of the, it's funny, like I run an economic development organization, it's a financial institution, so I am in, I am in business, but like my background is, is writing and journalism and public relations, so I very much come out of the humanities and, and, and take a, a different look at, at life, and my, one of my concerns around how we've structured our society is that we've turned ourselves into labor. 40 years of labor, right, to maximize productivity. And you see this in social media too. And I think it's really not helpful where we're gamifying our own lives. We're measuring everything. We're measuring our calories. We're measuring how much we weigh. We're measuring how much we have. We measure how, you know, we have certain thresholds. I need to have a house by this age and a car yeah. by this age. I need to change my car and I need to go on so many vacations a year and I need to post that and, and let people know this great life that I have. And it's all consumption and you're watching the time fly by and like I found that the most meaningful times in life are as simple as, you know, being surrounded by three or four people that you love, that love you, hanging around a campfire, doesn't cost any money, yeah. um, and just having a really good conversation. That's not to say 
it's bad to have a McMansion or a nice vehicle or whatever, because I have a nice house and I've got a couple of vehicles and all those things. Um, but they're beside the point. If I were to lose them today, I'd, I'd be fine with it. Um, but what isn't acceptable to me is losing a lot of the people in my life, right? Um, and the relationships that I have. And so when I, you said it, like, wake up people, I often feel that way. Not that I'm some you know, philosopher from on the mount here, I'm trying to figure it out like everybody else. But I think we got it wrong when we're, we're engaged in the rat race all the time. And at some point, I think if you have a, an ounce of self-awareness, you wake up and realize like, I could do this completely different if, if you really want it, right? Uh, your life, you right. could reinvent yourself. You could try something different and, and take the risk. You never, somebody, I've heard this from people who are older than me, you know, on their deathbed, when people get to the end of their life, they they never um, regret usually the things they did. They often seem to regret the things they didn't do. Um, and, you know, and it, that's not to say we, we wouldn't and it, change. And it's the time, right? The time that we waste on nonsense, yeah. you know, on, nonsense. on how yeah. much we put invest in nonsense that we forget about the little things. It's like that little beetle, right? Yeah, that, that yeah absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you know, you, you asked me, like, how did I, you know, get into fiction? And why did I get into fiction? I think I just hit a certain point in my life where I was like, you know what, like, shit or get off the pot, man, you've wanted to be a writer your whole life. So sit down and bloody well, write. And who cares if you're a bestseller or not? That's not the point. The point yeah. is to create. The point is to do the work. It doesn't matter where it ends up. And when I finally realized that, then I said, okay, now I need to build the habits for that. Um, because writing isn't doesn't come in spurts of inspiration every day. You actually just have to sit down and start hammering away at the keyboard and put two sentences in front of two sentences. And then eventually you get something and it's not good in the beginning and eventually it gets better. Um, but it's like anything in life. I just didn't want to get to the end of my life and say, oh, I really wish I'd done that. Um, I'm doing it and it, and I don't know where it goes, but I'm not going to stop doing it. Right. It's just get, get it done. Like if, if it, it keeps calling you, just do it. You yeah. know, uh, it's like with me, with tea, my tea was given to me at the age of four and I just kept hearing tea time, tea time, tea time, but it wasn't about the beverage. It was about life stories and words on how we communicate. And I found that this was a good way of getting communication out there is having that one-on-one, -on -one, having that one-on-five, -on -five, like, you know, have yeah. that conversation, open discussion where we can have a debate and still not be enemies. Like, you know what I mean? Have that yeah. open talk and say, we can do this together. Maybe, maybe a little bit of your way, maybe a little bit of my way. Let's work it together, you know? Yeah. Uh, but yeah. we, we talked about this before we went live too, Joel, about accountability, right? In today's world. Yeah. You know, can we just raise our hand and say, I did it. Like, you know, yep. and then yep. fix it. <laughs> and then fix it. Like, right. Yeah. Fix it. We all make mistakes. We're all flawed. It, you know, anybody who's walking around there who's projecting this perfect life and, and sort of, you know, complete moral co code is it's bullshit. Um, <laughs> I'm not perfect. Um, and no one is. And you know, <clears throat> everybody has a right to privacy um, around their their lives, but at the same time, you know, people in glass houses, right? Like, you you shouldn't judge because I bet every every one of us has got stuff going on or stuff yeah. that we we do or wish we didn't do or whatever it is that we need to own. And I think, you know, when you make a mistake, because it's not if, it's when, um, yeah. then you just say, yeah, that happened. Um, and the why behind it is less important than just saying, yeah, that happened. Um, I'm sorry to the people that that hurt. And here's what I'm going to do differently from this point on. And then you get on with it um, because yeah. it's already happened. There's no going back now. Right. Um, and, and that's it. And to, to your point, wow, we've lost that in, in society. Right. Um, and I think that, we all know there is so much disingenuous representation in social media by so many people at different levels of society right now. This is why everybody is fundamentally angry about yeah. our politics, our culture is, you know, you and I don't know one another. We sit down and it turns out we get along and we can have a conversation. We can go on for an hour. It's not a problem, right? And I find that too. I find if you talk to people in real life, doesn't matter what their political background is, they get along and, and you always find common ground. But the moment 
moment you get people on social media, it's like they adopt this other personality to start drawing lines in the sand. They start trying to project the ego. Um, not productive, <laughs> right, in, yeah. in any way, right? Well, the ego, the ego really takes control of today's yeah. society, I find. Uh, I, I get really drained from it. I'm like, like, this is who I am. If you don't like who I am, well, then move on. There's another table. Like, yeah. let's not argue about this for the next 20 hours. You don't like me. You don't like me. Move on. You know, yep. it is what yep. it is, uh, you know, and I don't want to be everyone's cup of tea because if I am, well, then I'm not being true to myself. Well, I think that's true. There's, you know, six billion people or whatever on the planet, right? Like, you're not going to get along with everybody. And that's okay. Um, and we can, and you can disagree with people without being disagreeable. And and that's a that's a a thing a thing that I think is is really important. But yeah, if you're going to get on social media, or if you're going to get on your high horse, if anybody, and you start drawing lines in the sand and and sharing your opinions about this, that, or the other thing. I mean, A, expect that people are going to come back at you and they're going to attack you because you've you've put yourself in that court. Um, but B, you know, I, don't get all hurt about it because A, you put yourself in that court, but B, that's just their opinion too. And it's only as valuable as your own opinion is. Why walk around with that anger all the time, right? And that frustration over it, you know? So I stay, I stay clear from comment pages <laughs> online. <laughs> I even put it out there sometimes, Joel. I'll put I don't want any comments or any likes or loves. I just want to release today. And yeah. all of a sudden I get D -d 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 -d. I'm like, does anybody listen today? Like no, everybody just, 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 like, just like, I'm I'm coming for you. Like Yeah. Yeah. And you know, like uh hey, you want to comment? Cool, right? That's what it's there for. Right. Like that's, that's how you want to express yourself. It's fine. It's no judgment. Right. I mean, you do your thing. I, I just come at it from a perspective of, um, yeah, I, I, that's not how I'm going to choose to spend my time. And that's just my choice. It's not a comment on anybody else. It's just not how I'm going to live my life. Yeah. Joel, I want to get into your tea because the three words you gave me, I, I think they're really cool. Tough, emotional and adventure. So why those three words for your tea? Um, I think, I think the adventure one I've kind of answered, you know, I was talking to my cousin recently about sort of, we were talking about life and, and, you know, she was laughing. She's like, you know, you're kind of always have pursued the highest level of Maslow's hierarchy before you even had the first two or three figured out. And I'm like, yeah, that's kind of me. So I, I tend to, on the adventure one, I, I think that resonates just simply because a lot of the big decisions I've made in my life have been around, oh, that'll be a cool story to tell when I'm older, or that will be an adventure. That's how I left Vancouver and moved to Prince George in Northern BC. Like I was, I was in love with the landscape, but I also knew it would force me into this life of adventure. And it, and it certainly has been that, and that's been a consistent theme throughout my life. Um, tough and emotional, I think, go together because like tough for me isn't being somebody who swings their fists and, and gets into fights. It's somebody who, you know, through all of the, the mistakes and errors, you know, picks themselves up and, and keeps going again. And I've had a lot of stress in my life over, over the decades and things I've experienced. Um, I grew up in a home that would have been described as a broken home. They don't describe that anymore. Um, or that way anymore and uh relatively low income but it was also a home with a lot of love and so there was a yin and yang there there was challenge but there was love and you had to learn to be emotionally tough and resilient early on um and that's been consistent too throughout my career i've often been the youngest person who gets into a position of leadership early on um so you know when i was 26 27 i was an editor at a newspaper in vancouver um, and it was tough. You know, I had a newsroom of people that I was responsible for who had far more experience than I did. And I had to learn, you know, how to uh, grapple with that. The same thing happened when I was 31. I was appointed CEO of a public sector financial institution. Um, and this is a guy with a journalism background doing that. Um, it was a really steep uh, learning curve. It was a tough emotional journey. I had to pull on that, those skills of resilience um from my childhood and, and have kept building on them i had a marriage breakup when i was in my 20s um we just should have never she's a lovely person we just never should have gotten married um and only figured that out after we tied the knot um and so i've gone through those types of experiences in my life too and other experiences you know being a caregiver for my father before he passed away a year ago um, and, uh, you know, my wife and, and some of her health challenges and, and others. Right. And so one theme that's been very consistent for me is, yeah, like I'm not an alpha male fighter, uh, in the 
the ring. No disrespect to that. I, I, my brother actually was in martial arts as was my father. And I have a, a, a tremendous amount of respect for people to do that. Um, but for me, tough is, um, picking yourself up and keep going, uh, through whatever life throws at you. And, and life has thrown a lot at me. And some of it I have brought on myself because I've made those choices to pursue adventure and adventure fundamentally, um, presents risk. It's not an adventure unless there isn't some kind of risk associated with it. And so when you make a choice in your life to pursue adventure uh, in your relationships, in your career, in your day to day, whatever that adventure looks like for you, you are welcoming in a certain amount of risk. And sometimes it's going to go sideways on you. And to just keep picking yourself up day after day when it does go sideways on you and say, okay, uh, well, that was that. What did I learn from it? What do I have to apologize for? Um, where am I going from here? So when you ask me, you know, what's my T, tough emotional adventure were the three words that, that came to, to mind for me. And, and, you know, Joel, by you sharing that, uh, your three words and why you, why you gave me those three words, you know, it, it shows that being just our authentic selves, being real and raw and being open about the challenges in life, right? Because we yeah. all go through stuff and we all have that, oh my God, I should have never did this, but I did it. I learned. <laughs> Let's move on from it, right? I was the yeah. same way. I got married at 18 and I was just like, oh, I'm, I'm not doing this again. Like, you know, um, but you live and learn, right? From your lessons. Yeah. And, you, and it's when you pick yourself up that I find that that's the biggest lesson that we learn. It is. Yeah, it is when you pick yourself up and keep going. And also, too, you know, because we all I don't know that we all carry regret. But to your point, we all have things where like, yeah, that wasn't the best decision. But it's important to look back and say, well, when you made that decision, did you make it with good intentions? Right. Yeah. Were, you, were you with the information that you had available at the time? Were you trying to do the right thing? And if you can answer that honestly and you can answer it honestly, yes, like I found that's been helpful for me because I can look back on something that, you know, was a mistake. Um, and just say, well, it was a learning experience. Um, and it made my life interesting, um, which is kind of all I've ever really wanted. It, you know, I hope I live a long life. And I hope when I get to the end of it, people say, that guy, he packed it in. Um, we love him. We miss him. Wow, did he live quite the life. And, and that's it. Uh, that's that's the story I'd like to, to leave behind one day. Well, the legacy of uh, trying, right? And that's like what I get trying. from your story is trying, you know, just try, yeah. you know, even when you get into those uh, titles and, and departments where you become leadership at a young age and you just tried, you gave it the best that yeah. you could, you know, yeah. and I think that's a strong message for all the listeners out there, you know, just try, just, just do it, like try it. Just do it. Yeah, just do it. it you know, I when I talk to people in professional circles, especially young people, um, often that is what I'm saying is I'm saying, look, um, you don't know how it's going to turn out, um, but you probably regret it if you don't. And what I found that builds success in any situation is uh, an open mind, an ability to get along with people, good intentions and work hard. And you know what? Some things don't work out. But I've, but what I do find is if you get along with people and people see you're working hard and you have good intentions, even if whatever you're pursuing doesn't work out for you, somehow the universe has a way of creating a safety net for you and you'll be largely looked after. Um, another opportunity, another door will will open for you. And so as I've gotten a little bit older, I've started to start almost like, I'm, again, I'm not a religious person, but I almost kind of see there is a web that's being we, uh, woven around us. Um, and uh, just give it your best, try it out and things don't work out. That's okay. That wasn't meant for you. Um, the next thing will be and enjoy the ride. Absolutely. Well, Joe, I asked you what your favorite color was and you gave me green. Why green? Yeah. Green, uh, because I grew up in Vancouver and everything is green. Um, oh, the, the, the forestry, right? Yeah, it's the conifers and the deciduous trees and it's green all year round. Um, I find green incredibly soothing and I love it. I love being in the forest. I love being outdoors. Um, the seawater's green there. So, you know, everything is, is green. Green to me is life um, and, and represents that. Uh, one of my favorite times of year up here is the first three weeks of May when you the trees start getting their leaves again and you get this beautiful, rich green in the forests and it's like the whole world's coming back to life. Um, I love driving around Northern BC during during that time of year. So yeah, green. Well, I guess that's when the flowers all pop up, right in May? 
Yeah. 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 Typically. I'm yeah. always on yeah. Ontario and I've, I've only been out west to Manitoba and Saskatchewan and stuff like that. But I mean, I've never been to BC. I've been oh. to Edmonton. So. You got to get here. BC, A, BC is another world. Um, but I mean, it's, it's mountains and glaciers and ocean and it is something else. I feel very, I've been to Ontario too and, and lived in the prairies for a little while and I've been to the Maritimes. There is not an inch of this country that isn't gorgeous. Um, yeah. There just isn't. Like Canada is beautiful. Um, but I'm a BC boy. I always will be. It's my place. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a cool place to call home. I, I think it's really cool that you said Canada's cool, you know, because there is so much hidden gems out there. Like I yeah. am finding gems all over Ontario and, and then I'm just like, when did they get this out here? Like, when did we get yeah. that? When, like, you know, yeah. and I'm following because most of the times I'm following them because I'm following all of these tourists. Uh, accounts that are on TikTok or Instagram, right? And I'm just like, where is that in Ontario? And then yeah. I go and I check it out, right? And yeah. And you know, I think we, I like, I get it, it from why we promote Canada via the big cities, because those are the gateways and those are the, that's where all the people are and where you come in. But I think we also, to some extent, do ourselves a disservice because often your best experiences in Canada are actually getting out into the little communities in like middle or northern Ontario or Quebec. Um, you know, out and around Edmonton in the prairie, uh, you know, the some of the vast areas like, you know, if you go up like Winnipeg's a cool town, but Selkirk and Gimli are gorgeous, right? In in Manitoba. Same with St. John's is a great town in Newfoundland, but actually get outside of St. John's and you get to see other parts of Newfoundland, New Brunswick, right? Like this country is so we're so lucky to have it this big uh, I, you know like in british columbia you could spend your entire life exploring bc and you still wouldn't see all of it by any stretch um and then you've got the rest of the country including the territories right like yukon i've spent some time in it's beautiful um we're very very blessed and the cool thing about this country is it's full of largely nice people. It doesn't matter where you go. And there's a Tim Hortons. It doesn't matter where you go either. So it's kind of the same experience right across the country, right? <laughs> so are you a Tim Hortons guy? You had like, hold my cup. Actually, I no. <laughs> like I had a Tim Hortons this morning. A friend of mine brought one and gave it to me and it's pretty good. But I actually, I have to admit, I prefer McDonald's coffee uh, these oh. days over Tim Hortons. Yeah, it's actually, I like it a little bit more. But that just tells you I don't drink fancy coffee. <laughs> <laughs> I like the cheap stuff. Yeah. There's a saying with us Canadians, right? That we can get through any storm, right? Just hold our Timmy's like, here we go. Yeah. Pretty well. Yeah. As long as there's something warm to drink nearby, we'll be fine. Yeah. So Joe, what final message would you have for everybody and how can people get your books? Uh, well, you can find me online at www.joelmckay.ca uh, and you can find my books on Amazon. Just search my name. Um, so please go buy them so that I can do this full time one day. That would be awesome. Uh, and I suppose probably the only final message I have is probably I think where our conversation went today, which is uh, what you said. Just do it. Whatever it is in your life that you want to do, forget whether or not you're going to get famous or make a million bucks with it. Um, if it's good intentions and you're able to pursue it without it, you know, coming at the cost of other people or relationships, then go out there and try it. Life is too short to sit there on your hands with ideas that you never pursue. Well, I really enjoyed this conversation. Like, and I just never know where my guests and me go with our conversations. But, you know, it's just how stories and words go together. We just spill in different ways and go down different paths and different angles. And I love that you said that, you know, just get back up. Because sometimes you think you need to go right, but you need to go left. But the yeah. lesson tells you, right, to pause yeah. and turn sometimes. And that's, that's right. what I got from this conversation is, you know, just pause sometimes. And yeah. take that that moment to just, okay, where am I going? It's like the beetle right. in the tree, right? What, what yeah. am I going to do? What's that little thing that's going to make the difference in the world? You know, yeah. and being a writer, and I'm really glad that you put that out there, Joel. I, I say it all the time. I'm a writer myself. It's not something that makes you a million bucks. It's passion and purpose right behind it. It's, yeah. you know, just do it just right. Um, you know, and, and don't worry about the titles all the time. Just get it out there and leave a legacy yeah. because your words are going to be there for life once you're gone. So yeah, I, I really, really enjoyed this conversation, Joel. And I'm so glad that we were able to reschedule this, uh, you know, and have this conversation together. Yeah, um, me too. Thank you.
Well, and, and thank you so much. And thank you for giving me a little bit of uh, BC from Ontario. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> yeah, come on out. It's a fun place. Right? So I will be back tonight at 7 p.m. with Gary V. Witt. Graphs. I hope I'm saying his last name right. Uh, and we're going to be talking about education, patents, and all of that good stuff in his new book that came out, uh, Learning and Learning and Education in One Small Room, I believe his book is called. We're going to be talking about that. And you know how Miss Liz likes to talk about education because T is teaching educational awareness one story at a time. So until then, I will wish you guys all well. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for your support your, and your comments. And Keep spilling your tea. Keep being real. Keep being true to yourselves. And we'll make a difference one cup of tea at a time. Until then, I'll see you guys at 7 p.m. And we'll do this all over again.